Hi, how are you? Deepak here. I'm still in Omaha, Nebraska. My flight was delayed by 15 hours, believe it or not, and then finally canceled, so I had to come back to the hotel. And here I am, and now uh, I'm going back to the airport uh, almost a day later. So um, this is another lesson in... Uh, in knowing that uh, the best thing to do when things uh, don't go your way is uh, let go of your idea of how they should be, trusting that you may not know the big picture because everything happens for complex reasons and um, there are so many factors involved, even in a flight, the health of the pilot, the weather, the condition of the plane, um, the other traffic routes that are uh, at uh, jeopardy because your flight is delayed, people's plans, and all the time we're only thinking of ourselves. So in any case, this gave me some time now to speak to you and continue our conversation around um, you are the universe discovering your cosmic self and why it matters the books uh, being read by many people and I'm very grateful to all of you and today's question comes from Susan and Susan says uh, I would like to ask what to do about feeling quote-unquote homesick not feeling like you belong in this world wanting to return to God and the angels and making peace with the destiny of this world and that my idealistic, visionary way of seeing is not everyone's. I have moments of feeling home when I feel so connected to them, and I feel the overwhelming love and acceptance of them. Then I have to return to the mundane world and those who don't see or understand me. I try to keep my thinking on as high a vibration as I can with many forms of holistic and spiritual practices but because I deal with depression and complex PTSD, it is hard sometimes to do this. It is sometimes more of an existential depression, feeling like I'm not doing my job here to the best of my ability, uh, seeking meaning and uh, peace in all that has happened so I can continue to ascend and be the teacher I'm here to be, trying to remember to separate from the ego and to know others have free will to choose and decide what they want to experience. I think part of it is trying too hard to be perfect and knowing I can't because I'm in a human body. Uh, I can't make others see me as I am or listen to the messages that I'm here to send about love and light and peace and cooperation with all beings. That sounds egotistical, but it isn't about me, capital M-E. It is about the message. I'm only the vehicle, the emissary. Some lady once said I was an emissary and getting too caught up in the human condition and forgetting my job as messenger and so got depressed and homesick. She was so right. I know everyone is where they are in their development, but I want them to see the truth and let in the light and maybe the wanting so much for everyone to be who they can be is ego and patience. I'm learning to just relay the messages and let it be. I used to work as a special ed teacher and now I do healing work and sometimes I feel like I'm surrounded by special ed students and have to be patient. I know a lot of this is ego and learning to be comfortable in the human body with imperfection. Though the memory of home and love is so strong, it's hard to be here. I really think a lot of this is just trying to make peace with being in a body instead of just free spirit. I have not had an issue with remembering um, spirit. I have had more trouble with being in a body in a dense world. Thank you. So, uh, I think uh, what Susan is displaying is uh, what has been called uh, in many spiritual traditions, but attributed to first, first to St. John of the Cross, um, the phrase uh, called dark night of the soul or we can even say uh, uh, 
uh, existential existential angst existential angst a kind of a deep feeling of uh, anxiety dread typically not focused on any one thing but on the human condition or the state of the world so it, it is a relatively common experience for those um, who um, uh, who are on the spiritual path um, i think eckhart tolle uh, talks about it in his lectures and in his book as well um, and um, dark night of the soul the poem was written somewhere around 1577 to 1579 when st john uh, of uh, the cross was in prison in toledo in spain and um, um it's a beautiful poem you know i remember a few stanzas in an obscure night fevered with love's anxiety o oh, hapless hopeless plight forth from my house where all things quiet be so for anyone uh, who's in the existential um doldrums uh, this uh, sounds very evocative and uh, is also uh, kind of a very nostalgic because we all uh, at some point feel that uh, homesickness um, for a return to our source the question uh, that um, uh, susan has posed is filled with many judgments about herself and about the world as well and um, uh, in many ways um, uh, the answer to her uh, to her dilemma is not through a system of thought be it religion or theology or even a scientific understanding of uh, of how things work um her um, existential dilemma um is of course mixed up with uh, other kinds of depression ptsd and uh, and uh, complex uh, uh ptsd as she calls it so i don't have all the details but let me just address the issue of uh, existential uh, angst existential doldrums dark night of the soul there comes a time in um, our spiritual seeking uh, in some of us uh, and it's happened to me as well um, that everything appears meaningless uh, and uh, the the uh, pursuit of human beings for mindless um success for mindless activity for mindless behavior in general leading to immense human suffering violence um um and uh, and destruction and um abuse uh, gets uh, to the point that the experience of watching that gets to a point that it leads to almost a nihilism and a and a depression and an anxiety about the essential meaninglessness of life after all if science tells us that there are 2 trillion planets 700 sextillion stars trillions and trillions upon trillions of planets and that we are microbes of the speck of dust in a mindless void in what uh, we have created the junkyard of infinity then of course that can uh, lead to uh, deep uh, anxiety depression meaningless and that's what uh, meaninglessness and that's what uh, existential doldrums are all about in the dark night of the soul is about so here are some suggestions to susan and to anyone who's experiencing this number 1 um uh, realize that thinking about this is not going to solve the problem so uh, try not to um 
analyze this too much. Try and be still. You know, Franz Kafka once said uh, words to the effect that uh, learn to be still and quiet and then the world will freely offer itself to be unmasked. It has no choice. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet. So first of all, try and uh, be uh, still and silent. Whatever your method is, uh, spend some time in stillness through meditation, self-reflection, transcendence, and uh, mindful awareness of sensory experience and mindful awareness of choice, what I have previously called metacognition. That's number one. Uh, number two, try not to judge, label, evaluate, analyze, describe everything that you experience because all your labels are just human constructs that have been programmed into human consciousness uh, for thousands of years and they are basically thoughts that are recycling through you and um, uh, they don't belong to you. They belong to the collective conditioned mind which is recycling through you. Uh, number three, try and spend time in nature and in uh, silence in nature and uh, connect to the source by being in touch with that activity of the source of the universe that we um, call uh, nature whether it's a forest or a, or a desert or a mountain or by the ocean or in the wilderness if you can uh, spend some time connecting with uh, source energy. Uh, number three, um, number three, uh, practice um, the law of giving. The more you give to others, uh, the more you commit to a cause higher than yourself, the more that takes you away from your separate self. Um, so I would say that's uh, uh, practicing the law of giving. Uh, understand also, number four, that um, uh, karma is uh, what we're talking about right now. It's the collective conditioning of the human race, uh, which, as I've said, uh, has uh, been recycled and in a way improved upon. The conditioning gets more and more deeper. Um, and it's all kinds of conditioning, theological conditioning, philosophical conditioning, religious conditioning, economic conditioning, uh, historical conditioning, parental conditioning, cultural conditioning. So, um, you know, that is what karma is. And karma is uh, overcome by first um, uh, becoming aware of your conditioning and then uh, uh, questioning every belief, every thought that you have and um, asking yourself whether it is true. Um, so that would I, I would say is number four. Number five, uh, know that uh, if your life is uh, um, one of resistance to what is, then, um, um, then you are resisting the flow of the universe. So try to be um, with the moment, without any anticipation, without any regrets, without any resistance, um, be with what is. And uh, when that happens, as I've said before, there's the experience of flow. There's effortless spontaneity, effortless creativity, there is richness of sensory experience, there's a lack of ego self, there is um, uh, a sense of timelessness, and there is um, a synchronicity. So um, be without resistance. Um, um, uh, number six, or whatever the number is, 
focus on your deepest intentions. What uh, do I really want uh, in my life? And um, nurture them in your heart, but also detach from them. So once again, that is the principle of letting go and flow, but with subtle intention. What in wisdom traditions is called sankalpa, the Sanskrit word sankalpa, subtle intention. Um, um, so that leads to number seven, uh, detach from outcome, uh, stay in the process. And number eight, um, find your true calling, which is uh, a return to your higher self and ultimately being one with the divine or with the source. So these are some ideas for you. Um, I was, interestingly enough, yesterday watching a, a TED uh, uh, talk by a cognitive scientist um, by the name of Anil Sait from Sussex University in England. And he was um, basically saying through very elegant scientific reasoning that uh, the world that we collectively experience as human beings is a hallucination produced by the brain. He said there are uncontrolled hallucinations that occur in people with psychosis and there are controlled hallucinations in that the brain delivers to you what um, you have been conditioned to believe is out there. And since a lot of our conditioning is collective, then the brain delivers to the human brain. Um, the, the, the human brain delivers to you um, a collective controlled hallucination. So while I found the talk by Anil said to be very interesting, I realized that he had also been bamboozled by the scientific construct um, of something called a brain. A brain is uh, a perceptual experience like any other. <coughs> it is a name that humans have given to an experience, a three pound uh, shape and a color and a texture and a mass and a smell, uh, if you want, a taste and uh, texture as well. Um, but it's been given this name brain and it has now become um, that which delivers to us um, the collective controlled hallucination. But I would ask Anil Sait, uh, um, I would ask Anil Sait, uh, isn't the brain itself a hallucination because it's also a perceptual experience like any other? And so are you using a hallucination to um, explain a hallucination? Are you using a dream to explain a dream? This is where scientific uh, conditioning, uh, while very useful for creating technology, actually uh, takes us away from the truth. Ultimately, there is only existence and awareness of existence. And the two are synonymous. Now, how we define that existence as human beings is a construct. We take uh, our experience of shape and color and call this a book or this a watch or this a bracelet or this a body or this inside a brain. And then uh, we... Um, we get bamboozled by our own constructs. And so uh, we have to actually go a little bit beyond um, constructs, even scientific constructs, to understand reality as it is. And reality cannot be a construct. Reality can, of course, be only that which um, um, gives raw experience a concept a concept, a construct, a meaning. Fundamentally, all the meaning that is there in your life is that which you have given to it. 
And the highest meaning, of course, is, um, is there is only uh, spirit, there is only consciousness, there is only divine intelligence, there is only divinity, there is only God. And um, a deeper understanding of this divine being as fundamentally you without all your constructs and without all your imposed meanings it's you even that which we call the universe is you so this is important to understand and uh, i am having to take a very so i'm back here and susan i hope i've answered your question um, um, Yes, a lot of your questions are coming from the separate mind, from the ego mind. That is part of the hallucination. So, um, um, be still and know that I am God is a beautiful expression and uh, it uh, is true. It's true. Nothing that you can label, define, describe, give a name to is real. The label is a construct, a name and a description to an experience. The experience itself is a modified form of Consciousness or awareness. Consciousness modifies itself as a thought, modifies itself as a feeling, modifies itself as an image, modifies itself as a sense perception, and then modifies itself into the interpretation of all this, which we call thought, and then creates the separate mind, the separate body, the separate brain, and the separate experience of the universe. It's a journey and uh, I can only say congratulations to anyone who has experienced the dark night of the soul because at the end of the tunnel there is the light of the divine, the light of being, the light of awareness which summons forth the world into manifestation. You are the light of awareness in which the universe, the entire universe and the experience of the universe is arising and subsiding in every now. So thank you very much and uh, thank you for your wonderful comments. Shauna, thank you for sharing this video. I see that hundreds of people are sharing this video and sharing this conversation and I'm very grateful to you that we can do this every day so we can slowly begin to dismantle our constructs. This is a pencil because we agree to call it a pencil otherwise it's a shape and a form. It's a, the act of seeing and seeing cannot be separated from the seer and the seer is awareness and awareness is now knowing itself as this pencil or this body or this screen or this universe. Awareness knows itself as both subject and object of experience. Walter Murphy and 54 others, thank you for sharing this video. Thank you for all your love and thank you for all the hearts and thank you for all the shares and thank you for all the comments. Uh, see, when, when we begin to see that that which we call the other is me in a different disguise, in a different uniform, the uniform or mask being the body, then there is the birth of true love. That's what we are. That's who we are. Love. The ultimate truth. 
at the heart of the universe, at the heart of creation.